going on, everyone? Welcome back to A2A Roundtable. Today, Reed and I are joined by Michelle Meyer, the creator of NIL Network, as well as the NIL coordinator at San Diego State University. She has a ton of insight of where the NIL started, where it is now, where she can see it going, and some of the just most pressing questions that come from this whole topic of name, image, and likeness. Michelle, thank you for joining us today. Really appreciate it. Really looking forward to your insight. Um, you know, the NIL is something that everyone is talking about, Reed and I, and as, as well as Justin. We dig into it probably as much as possible when we're not on camera. We try to cover other topics when we are on camera, but the NIL is something that is always evolving and they're looking at new data new analytics and there's new things that are always coming up about it so very happy to have you on um and i'm gonna actually let reed jump in with the first question awesome thanks yeah for sure so michelle i would love to just kind of kick things off and kind of provide some context for what's going on can you please give us kind of your sports background your relationship with college athletics um you know i know obviously you're the founder of nil network and you're working with san diego state university right now as their nil coordinator um but but even before that i mean what what is sort of your connection to college sports and kind of what what got you down the path of wanting to dive into this head first yeah so so my whole background is in uh volleyball i played collegiately at uc santa barbara for a year professionally uh overseas in denmark and uh, then I got into the coaching side. So coached collegiately um, beach volleyball, actually, at University of Hawaii, twist my arm, and uh, then at Pepperdine University, um, and then worked for USA Volleyball running the Beach High Performance Program. So that was for kids age 12 up through about 25, uh, the national pipeline to the Olympic team, essentially. And when I was working there, that's when um, I was born and raised in California, and that's when California passed their NIL law. This was in the fall of 2019. I was like, holy moly, this is a massive change. I knew that NIL would always come to the forefront of college sports. I always just thought it would be the NCAA doing the right thing and actually adapting their rules. Um, didn't really understand that a state could stand up in the way that they did. And so at that point, I started studying it pretty um, extensively and just making some hypotheses about, okay, that you know, NCAA was starting to kick out the California schools. What would that look like? Um, we know that didn't happen. Fast forward a year to the end of 2020, and I started looking at it again, and all these deadlines were coming, and nobody was really paying attention, um, I think, due to the pandemic and really not having sports in 2020, and but none of the deadlines had changed. Everything was coming in 2021, so um, I created NIL Network really as a passion project to try to pull together a lot of these resources to help coaches, athletes, administrators understand all the changes, and then also to push myself to really understand everything that was happening as well, because as you mentioned, it's a, it has a lot of complexities and layers, and we're learning more and more about those every week, it seems. <laughs> no, that's yeah. awesome. Well, I think, too, one of the things that I really liked about NIL Network, comparative to what seems to be the growing, growing market um, in the NIL world, is that, you know, your company is founded primarily at the moment on, you know, knowledge transfer and, and, and resourcing and databasing. I feel like everyone wants to get in the game and be part of the marketplace, or they want to have, you know, their hand in some kids involvement when it comes to marketing and take a slice off the top or whatever it might be. Um, and I have, it's been very refreshing to, to be able to go to NIL network and just get a bevy of information and resources about NIL without what feels like sort of a call to action to sign up for their portal or sign up for, you know, get in touch with one of their advisors or whatever it might be. I think that's been, for me, really helpful. And it's made it easy to, to go there instead of other places to find that information. Yeah, and I think as, as I progressed um, through, I mean, it's been about a year and a half now that I've been uh, updating an IL network. And I, I think that for, for myself, because I come from the Olympic sport background and from coaching, I really have a soft spot for, for those athletes that aren't going to be making life-changing money. But like, how can I help those guys in their entrepreneurship skills, their life skills, and things that they'll take with them after they actually graduate out of college? Um, and so I've, I've kind of made a, a cognizant, um, I guess, idea of, of not really focusing so much on the big brand deals and like, oh, this kid gets a car, or that million dollar deal over here, and really trying to help everyone understand what it looks like for the other, you know, 99% of athletes that aren't having their DMs broken down by national brands every single day. So. 
That's really cool. Yeah. And, and that's, that kind of goes into the question I had for you is, you know, you talked about how California was really the first state to put anything in place. You know, they kind of forced the hand of the NCAA after being kind of the first case study, right? So, you know, how would you assess how this first year um, with NCAA, NIL in its totality, you know, has really has really gone, right? You said you didn't want to focus on that 1% of athletes that are getting, you know, the, the grand treatment in the red carpet, you know, so you've really looked at the, the total number of these NIL athletes getting all these opportunities. How would you kind of grade this first year of the NIL within the NCAA? Yeah, I actually think we have, we have a long ways to go. And the reason for that is just the, the overall education for those 99% of athletes that aren't going to have that team of advisors around them um, is just pretty pretty bad actually across the country. I was surprised the other day, I did an audit of all the D1 universities to see what they were offering really. And we have a lot of work to do um, because I think in time, you know, probably the majority of these deals will be done at the local level. Um, the athletes that aren't, you know, those celebrity status, they're trying to figure out not only all the rules and regulations, but how do they even create, like, what do they want to do with their NIL? How do they go about that? How do they approach a brand or a small business they want to work with, you know, format the, the contract, the negotiations, all of those kind of pieces. It's, it's complex. And I think that it's a lot for, for these student athletes that are already full-time students and full-time athletes. And even if you look at the other side with the small brands that could really benefit from working with um, local college athletes, they also have no idea really how to navigate this space. Like the influencer industry has really just boomed in the last probably about half decade or so. It's been around for a decade, but the last half decade is really when it's been in the, this, what, $15 billion industry now. Um, so I think the local businesses as well in the community, um, there's a huge opportunity for, for education and to get them more engaged with local athletes. Mm -hmm. And how would you, you know, going into that with the, the student athlete aspect of it, obviously the brands have been doing this forever, right? It's a new market for, for them and, you know, it allows them to expand their brand, but for these athletes, it's not really a territory that they've ever really been in. Um, how would you say the athletes have handled their, their new popularity and their new power of being able to, you know, make money off of who they are? Yeah, I think, I mean, I'm a big advocate for, for athletes utilizing third-party platforms, at least when they're getting started in this space, because I think it adds that layer of protection of them that these companies are either having a templated contract that they're requiring brands to use, or they're vetting the contracts to make sure that they don't have language in that that's going to take advantage of the athlete or potentially even have them be ineligible, because we still have a lot of the NCAA rules, you know, the state NIL, and then your institutional policy, these athletes have to follow. So um, especially at San Diego State, when athletes come in, I'm always like, pick a platform. There's a ton of out there that are looking to help you. Yes, of course, these guys, they are running a business. They're going to take 15%, 20%, whatever that might look like. Understand where they're taking that money, though, and how their business model works, because I think that's another important part of it. But I think that utilizing those just is really, really helpful for, for them in the beginning to navigate this new space. Without, without a third-party company, I think it's really difficult. And I think that doing deals through DMs is like the worst case scenario. Um, and a lot of them have been done that way. Yeah. Sounds, sounds about right. You know, with the athletes that, you know, you see out there and, and a lot of them started with the putting things in their bio of, you know, my DMs are open for opportunities. Right. And um, luckily there are people like you that show them that that's not really the right way to go about it. Um, so when you are working with these athletes, what are some of the, the tips and advice that you give them for garnering these new deals and working through these contracts? Yeah, and I think that was one of the, uh, you know, the things that the media didn't do a great job. And I don't blame them because their job is to have, you know, massive headlines to get a lot of readers on it. But the focus over the past eight months has really been on those big deals. And I think that even going into July 1st, that's how I was kind of pitched to athletes. Like everyone's going to make their six figures, seven figures. All you got to do is open your DMs. And you're like, no, and I was going to be work for 99% of athletes. If you're not that celebrity status on, you know, ESPN or whatnot, you're going to have to work for it. Um, so when the athletes come in my office, the first thing I always ask them is like, what, what do they want to get out of their NIL? So is it a quick buck? Because that is one route we can go down and that's totally fine. But identifying that versus, okay, do we want to, um, 
gain some life skills, build your network, uh, build your resume? Like what kind of thing are you really trying to look to get out of it? And then after that, we can identify, okay, so if it's to make a quick buck, probably social media endorsements, like the easiest thing that they can do. We can take a look at your social media account, see what your following looks like, and if it um, is something that brands would want to partner with, really. Um, you know, if they want to do some coaching, mentorship, uh, entrepreneurship, it's really identifying those things and then kind of walking down that path with each individual athlete. So, Michelle, I'm curious because I would think that when NIL was first, you know, they opened the floodgates, here it is, I would have assumed that a vast majority of the students and or coaches would have been knocking down your door want to ask questions, learn more, know things about it. From a media perspective, from a fan perspective, it seems like this big top of mind thing that's going on all the time. But when you and I first had a conversation, if I remember correctly, it was more so you having to approach individuals and kind of get them comfortable with the idea of NIL. And that to me seems so antithetical from what I feel like we hear in the media is that, I mean, what's that experience been like, you know, approaching coaches or players and just helping them understand what this is? I I would have thought they would have been coming to you way more often. Yeah, and I, I think that kind of goes, you know, back to the, the media portrayed it in such a way that a lot of athletes are going, well, and I also stop for me. I don't have 100,000 followers. I don't have the celebrity status, so I can't have any, or these opportunities are just not something I even want to try to navigate. And I think that, you know, and now I've been, I don't know, four or five months here at San Diego State, it's more of educating them on all the things, even outside of social media endorsements, because even... A lot of athletes now, and this has been a bit surprising to me, but um, surprising in a good way that they aren't that into social media and they don't want to be living on their phones. And they they see that like that's not really a positive like trait to be building. And so they're saying, okay, well, like, what other things can I do? And I, I tell them, you know, at least as Division One athletes, you are a role model to someone back in your hometown. You played at your club, played at your high school even across, you know, the country, because you've made it as that D1 athlete. Um, and so mentorship opportunities, coaching opportunities, um, I think right now as well, because the NIL space is so big and athletes, like, they like to go into sports industry and, and be entrepreneurs, like, they can do cool internships with some of these even startup companies. And I think it's just opening their eyes to a lot of these different opportunities that are outside of social media and outside of those celebrity athletes that make them a little bit more comfortable. Because, yeah, I guess they're they're a little timid to be like well I, I don't want to do social media but like what else am I going to be doing so mm -hmm. um yeah I think that's just like that unawareness and education again yeah absolutely well and I think you know again the 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 concept and the theory of NIL is wonderful and I and I'm so pro paying athletes and giving them an opportunity to to make money off of their name, image, and likeness. But it you did kind of have, for me at least as a former athlete, I did kind of have this moment of like, oh shoot, like now you're a student and you're an athlete and you're effect you're an independent business owner at this point. Like you have to find ways now to create yeah. monetary streams for yourself. Um, and I think it's just having someone like you in the office or having a resource like that to make it not seem so scary. I feel like it can make all the difference in the world. Cause otherwise, like you said, I feel like if I was 18, 19 years old, I start school. I'm trying to figure that out. I'm trying to play for my team, start for my team, stay on my team, whatever my status is. And now I've got this other thing that everyone's telling me that I need to take advantage of because it's new and we didn't have it and you should use it. And you have no, you have no concept of what it was before. And, and there's no, it, it's just, it's weird. Yeah. Yeah. No. And I think that, um, that, some some athletes are never going to engage in NIL, and I think that's totally fine too. Like one of the one of the things that's been asked me, like how can we make sure that all the athletes engage? And I'm like, they don't have to. This is their right to do it. Should they want to make some extra money or whatnot? But like if they don't want to, they are plenty busy with everything else they have on their plate. But um, yeah, I think that. I'll, but I'll go back and say, like I think that that's why I also recommend those third party platforms so much because I think that that takes a ton of the time off of their hands. Like it really is. You sign up here, you find something that makes sense. You don't have to worry about the contract process, um, disclosures, even a lot of the times, understanding all the rules and whatnot. It's like simplified here is your email that says exactly what you need to do, when you need to post, what you need to post. Okay, now I make a couple hundred bucks or whatever that might look like. Not really life changing money, but like, you know, something for not a lot of work, I think is simplifying the process. So 
uh, yeah, that they have to navigate it all on their own. Um, and I think that that's a lot of athletes right now and why the activity has been so low in the first year outside of um, those celebrity athletes is uh, it's just too much to navigate on their own. And I'll add to that, that I think that as an advocate of like those third party service providers, those are also hard to navigate for the athletes because they're mostly startups. They're, they're brand new and they're promising the world. And I can't even tell you how many athletes come in here. They just show me a DM from an NIL company and they go, have you heard of this company? Like, are they legit? Are they like, what's their business model? Are they going to take advantage of me? And like, that's where it's also really helpful since I've met with over probably about 120 of these companies now over the past year and a half. And uh, most of them I've heard of and I can say, okay, like, I can at least kind of vouch for that company. I've met the founder. I think their business model is great. And I think like of my conversations with them that they are in this for the right reasons. So mm -hmm. now <clears throat> the I kind of want to back up a little bit because we we discuss NIL like you know everyone's familiar with it, right? Like it, it's it's a trending topic and you know, but what is that process, right? Like what do these athletes need to do to make sure that they are set up to not just, um, you know, partake in their name, image, and likeness and, and benefit from it, but, you know, make sure they're paying taxes, make sure that everything is in the right space. So what does that process look like for an athlete that wants to start, you know, brings you that DM and says, this is my first deal coming through. What do I have to, what's next? Yeah, it's, it's a long one. Um, in terms of it, it is like Reed mentioned, it's you're running your own kind of small business and you're making decisions and negotiating contracts and really operating as like a, a solo entrepreneur. Um, and I think that, again, that's a, it's a space that's a little bit intimidating uh, to jump into. One thing I also recommend, you know, if they're gonna use a, a service provider at my marketplace or whatever that might look like, it's best to pick one, um, maybe two. And if people are DMing you, you can say, hey, here's my link to my profile over on this marketplace or, um, this is the company that I'm working with and try to get that all in one area because that'll also help at the end with, with tax season. A lot of these digital marketplaces, they accumulate whatever you've earned for the whole year and they only send you one form. So you're not having to pick all these tax forms from you know, 10, 15 different companies. Um, but yeah, I, I think the tax conversation is interesting as well when we look at the, the early statistics of you know, what is the actual median, not necessarily that the average deal amount is I think like $30 or something like that. So I think the, the tax side of things, of course, for the athletes that are making five, six figures, seven figures, even sometimes they're going to need a lot of help on their taxes. But I also think that they have that team around them to help educate them on, on those best practices or even do their taxes for them. Um, but I think for for the other athletes, I mean, they're probably going to be around a thousand dollars in this first year if they really kind of got after some things. Um, so I think that it's it's a learning curve, but I'm I'm thinking it's manageable for those ninety nine percent of athletes. Mm -hmm. And you've you know you've obviously studied this a ton, and one of the headlines that I saw was that the NCAA was going to be looking into this first year of NIL. Um, and one thing we know about the NCAA is that they want to make changes. They want to get in there and see what they can fix uh, or, or do with a new process, right? So, you know, what kind of changes would you see coming on the horizon for these athletes, for these different companies that want to continue with NIL um, that the NCAA may be looking at changing? Yeah, I, uh, I would be very surprised if the NCAA is able to pass any more rules or put any more kind of restrictions on NIL just because of everything that's played out over the last year and a half. Um, I think this investigation that they're doing is really to kind of build almost like a, a case and to bring that to um, our federal government to say, hey, we need a federal bill. Here are the reasons why. Um, and to try to push Congress into passing something. I don't... I, I, even in what that would look like, like I've spent quite a bit of time thinking about it. And I just, again, I guess I don't have, not have the background in law, but I uh, have just tried to think about what that bill would look like because the things that they're trying to pull back really are those collective groups that are popped up by um, boosters and whatnot. They're kind of, you know, getting money to, or a lot of money to, to athletes. And, you know, there's a quid pro quo, but it's not like, 
I don't know. I think that that's their main thing. And how do you pull back on like someone who's making endorsement deals with athletes who say that's not fair market value in the new market or all these other things? I just, I don't know how they could write that and actually not open themselves up to hundreds of millions of dollars of like further litigation, which is the thing they're really trying to avoid right now, I think. <laughs> yeah, that's for sure. That's for sure. Um, now, when, you know, the, what's the, what would you say is the, is, how the landscape has changed, right? Like from California introducing that they are going to establish kind of their own in-state NIL to it becoming global, you know, what, what's the, how much further away are we from that uh, inception to where we are now? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's, uh, it's, it's gonna be really interesting to look back on this first year, year of NIL and just like look at all the different trends and how it really evolved. Um, I actually just pulled the, what was it called? The Google Trends, I guess, the other day for NIL and just looked at all kind of the peaks and valleys of the search term for NIL and, uh, to see if I could identify what the all the little humps were. And I thought that was really interesting. Right now they are all around football. Like I think the first one was when um, Saban made the, the comment about Bryce Young calling in millions of dollars without even taking a, a snap. And then we had one around uh, early signing day for football in December. And then, um, you know, when Caleb Williams entered the transfer portal and all of that controversy around his uh, NIL deals that were not legit, like, come here, we're paying them bucks. Um, so I think that it'll be interesting to look at those trends, but I think in like a, like a high level trend that's going to happen is everything will become more local and more athletes will continue to get involved um, probably over the next five years or so I'd say as everything settles down a little bit the rules are easier to understand they feel more comfortable confident that they can do these things without jeopardizing their their eligibility and then as local businesses start to start to see that they can work with college athletes I think it's just going to increase the the volume overall. So Michelle, I'm curious on the coaching side, you know, we've talked a lot about the kids. I feel like on the coaching side, and again, we, we get everything from the outside looking in, right? So you read a lot of things about extreme responses, I guess, from different coaches in different areas, whether it be highly positive, highly negative, or otherwise. I'm curious, just sort of, you know, peeling the curtain back a little bit, you know, is the general consensus among coaches that this is something that is exciting and open up opens up a new conversation for recruiting? Is it intimidating because it's new and you don't necessarily know how to manage it in your day-to-day -day recruiting life cycle that everyone's been so accustomed to doing is it a mixed bag I'm, I'm just kind of curious what the general consensus is there yeah and I think it differs sport to sport like the football and even basketball they have to embrace it so you see all I think all the positivity right now it's like oh I love NIL I have my trepidations but I love it and that's from the, the football coaches and basketball because they have to use it as a recruiting advantage like they cannot afford to fall behind um, in that game at all. I think it will trickle down to the Olympic sports in time. Um, what I've seen, I presented uh, NIL at four coaching conferences this year, and I was a little shocked at just the coaches were not ready to embrace it yet. Um, they, I think it's just confusing and new, and they look at it saying, you know, my, my kids are already so busy with everything else that they're doing. I don't want them on their phones anymore. I don't want them on social media. Um, and so they're not really looking at it from like a full picture yet of what it could do for their program and their athletes. And then like, and also from a really, the, there are some simple ways for them to, to monetize their NIL that aren't gonna take a ton of time. And I think that that's kind of one of my missions as a corporate coach is really to educate and help them and say, you know, like this is here to stay. These are some different ways that you can, you know, take a leadership role on your team and make sure that it doesn't impact your team culture. Um, and that your athletes are doing this successfully while also not getting too hands-on that you're breaking any of the rules. But I think we have a long way to go on that as well. Yeah, I mean, it's a whole new highway, it feels like, to try and navigate on, on that whole thing. And it's interesting that you, when you say coaches were more concerned, it sounds like at those conferences about, you know, their ability to necessarily keep attention or engage or or have more uh, quality time with with the student athletes versus them being on their phones or trying to activate an IL. Again, from the outside looking in, I would have thought that a lot of the concerns stem from people thinking that it was going to create a bit of a power imbalance with certain teams, assuming, oh, well, these people have XY donors or XY, uh, can't even think of the word right now, popularity, 
Um, yeah. And so they're going to, you know, we're just going to lose players left and right to these places. They're going to use as a stepping stone, whatever it might be. That's a lot of the conversation that I hear from folks thinking that it's, you know, breaking the college system or whatever it might be. But it sounds like coaches are more concerned about just being able to engage with their student athletes versus them being more concerned about NIL deals. Yeah, I think that, um, again, like revenue generating sports that have to adapt so quickly, like that's what they're talking about more is like, oh my gosh, we're going to be losing players. We can't compete with these programs that have like, you know, all the backing and all the popularity in the world. Um, and then Olympic sport level, they just don't see it affecting their sport yet. Or they go, oh, it's only for football. Like, I don't have to worry about that. Um, and they're talking a little bit more about how their team culture potentially could be impacted. Like, so mm -hmm. some of their players who are on social media all the time, um, creating content and whatnot versus the ones that are like, I'm just here to train and I want to go to school and da, da, da. I don't want anything to do with social media. And to those coaches as well, I say, you know, it's a, it, I do think that falls on the coach's shoulders to take a leadership role, update your team policy, talk to your athletes about NIL and what your expectations are. And if NIL really drives um, a divide in your, in your team, then you probably didn't have that great of a team culture to start with because it's, I mean, it, it sounds harsh to say, but I'm like, I, I think that that falls on the coach and, and really understanding your team and, and talking to them. Um, I use this example, like uh, uh, Husker Volleyball, Nebraska Volleyball this year, had that conversation, John Cook, uh, before season started and said, I'm like happy that you guys have the opportunity to take advantage of your NIL. However, anytime we're in the gym, we are not saying those three letters. You are not allowed to utter those. You're not allowed to create content. Da, da, da. And like those go in line with the other rules of like, we don't stay on our phones. We don't do this da, 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 whenever we're training. And so it's not completely out of the realm of like what has already been going on. But, you know, they, they interviewed some of the girls about that at the end of the season. They all said they thought it worked well. Of course, they're not going to come out in national media and be like, it was terrible. But nobody gave <laughs> yeah. or follow that. But you know, at least there was an example of a coach that saw it, embraced it, and then set some rules around it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that makes a ton of sense. And you're absolutely right. You know, everything that you read about right now, or 99% of what you read about right now is football and basketball. So it's really hard to get an idea of what that looks like across the board. I mean, I think the only, probably the only other person I can think of that, that falls in an Olympic sport world that you would have heard of from an NIL perspective is Olivia Dunn from LSU because she's ascended into this like new sphere of of an IL popularity yeah. but yeah it's a I mean it's a whole different it does feel like it's it's sort of that group over here you know these revenue generating sports for lack of a better term right you know football basketball sits over here and then there's kind of everybody else and there's two different worlds of how that how that's navigated yeah and it kind of relates to real life too right like we see people are in celebrity status and whatnot and how things like kind of kind of come to them versus um you know having to actually create opportunities for yourself and, and get out there so i think it actually is very reflective of life that we see post-college as well yeah it's a good point yeah a lot of parody there um yeah i i think and i i as reed said we are all for athletes being able to make money off their name, image, and likeness. It's something that we have talked about, <clears throat> excuse me, we've talked about, you know, in meetings where we're just like, man, I, I really wish that I had the chance to take advantage of this. But then, you know, we sit and think about the types of student athletes we were, at least just the type of people we were at 18. And we're just like, that would probably be a disaster for me. You know, I, I don't know how I would really go about any of that, right? So when you're working with these athletes, is it, you know, do you think about who you were as a student athlete and try and relate to them in that way so that you can talk to them about NIL and have them understand it? Or are student athletes, I mean, savvier than we were when we were in college, right? Do, do they understand these things a lot better and, and know how to navigate them a little bit more? So when you when they come to you, they're on like a, a kind of a level playing field of what they know and, and how they do things. Yeah, and I, I find that so interesting with um, with the social media side of things because we're we're older telling them on the apps that were built for for you know kids their age how to do it and you're like yeah okay of course you can give some recommendations from like a business perspective some things like you should have your full name in there you should turn on the business profile so you get analytics or 
simple things like that, but like from like creating content and what actually will get you the engagement and, and followers and whatnot, I'm like, I'm no, I'm like no expert in that. I can help probably the most from using my, my coaching background, um, kind of as, as the assistant coach role, I was at Hawaii. I was definitely very close to the athletes and was uh, in tune with you know, their day-to-day life and whatnot. Um, and then also even from what I've done with NIL Network over the past year and a half and trying to navigate like starting a business and entrepreneurship and all those different elements, I think that I help, I can help them with a lot of those things as well that they, you know, like things like, oh, I, I think I want to register a business. How do I go about doing that? Uh, how do I start a website? What do I do with this or that? I think that those things from at least the entrepreneurship side, I'm much more helpful for than like the the branding and trying to tell them how to how to create TikToks. Like, no, <laughs> they're much better at that than I will ever be, and I'm okay with that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that yeah. Imagine that trying to tell a teenager how to create a TikTok. That'd be absolutely insane. Um, well, Reed, you got anything else that you would like to dig into? I, I have no other questions for her. Yeah, Michelle, I do have one more quick question for you. And I, we talked a little bit about it whenever you and I had a conversation uh, before, but I'd love to, to dive into it just a little bit more now is, you know, San Diego State, the, the NIL coordinator position that you have is obviously new. There's never been a reason for it in the past. And it kind of sounds like in a sense, you're blazing your own trail. But when you had that meeting with San Diego State, you know, what did they make it fairly clear on what the goals of that position were going to be? I mean, was it built very much to be a pure support role for those athletes? Was it trying to find ways to maximize, you know, recruiting opportunities for certain people in San Diego State University? I'm, I'm curious sort of what the, what the vision was or what the culture ideal was for that role within a college athletics office. Yeah, so I think San Diego State was around the fourth or fifth school in the the country to hire for an NIL specific position, which was really exciting for me. I'd already lived in San Diego for a couple of years. And um, when I started digging out the website, I was like, oh man, like get in there and build a a program. Like this is an awesome opportunity. Um, I remember the job listing, it didn't really have a lot of details on it. I was like, this is, I think I can actually kind of build my own position and role. And my supervisor technically uh, lived in the compliance department, although on the first day and I, my supervisor, the director of compliance said, I see NIL, you know, as its own, um, as its own kind of division. And he's like, if anyone is breaking rules, you send them to me. I, I've always been the bad cop. So that's fine. You'd be like kind of the good cop and the one that's really kind of the, the athlete advocate um, on the other side. So for the first couple months here, I was really working in the background of, um, and this, didn't really realize that some of the resources I built on NIL Network would be so helpful um, in terms of this role in here because I use, you know, I have the institutions and NIL database up there, which I use to filter through and pull and see what other schools are doing, kind of the best practices and um, build out my my strategic plan here, which I'm hopefully putting in place in the next two weeks. I'm really excited. Um, but um yeah, so I had a lot of autonomy to, to do some research, figure out what was working around the country, and then build out my program. And we have also have a great working group in place here that involves people from all different departments um, that are definitely kind of, you know, I put together my plan, I present it to them, and then get feedback from marketing and from our licensing and from our multimedia rights holders and like all these uh, development team because, you know, I... Of course, I've been studying NIL very, very closely for the past year and a half, but what I found is a little trickier is understanding all the nuances of the athletic department. So like, how does our multimedia rights work with licensing, working with development um, and marketing and da-da-da-da. So pulling all these pieces together, I think having that support team there is just so huge for um, what I'm trying to do and actually feel confident with my my decisions that are very much NIL focused um, and how they integrate it to the school. Very cool. Yeah, no, I think, like you said, it's, it's got to be a trend that, that's starting to, to take hold, not only in Division One institutions, but two, three. I mean, having someone like you in the office to, if nothing else, give kids a quality resource to bounce ideas off of or to check those DMs with or whatever it might be. You know, they don't realize what you're doing behind the scenes, but to just have that person that everyone in the office can go talk to Michelle. Like she can handle it. She's got you covered, I think is going to be such a incredible resources for schools as they start to build it out. I mean, that's, yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, One, I, oh, I'm sorry, I go ahead. I was going to say, I think that I, I 
have, there's like seven schools that are hiring for an NIL position right now. I just saw like last week, I added a uh, NIL kind of job board on the website as well. And so I'm trying to keep that updated with new opportunities, just because I think that this is going to start rolling as, as budgets turn over and schools are now able to add that line um, in for this new position. I think it's, it's going to be a lot of schools that will add someone. Absolutely. Yeah, I think it- yeah, you're obviously more in it than we are, but it sounds like it's just gonna, it's like a snowball, right? It's just gonna build and build and build as it goes down the hill. So it'll be fascinating to see how quickly departments start to allocate budget for that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, one final question on my end, um, you know, we work primarily with high school student athletes. We're trying to help them get prepared for the next level, wherever that might be, division one, two, three, junior college, whatever. But, you know, if you were in a room of high school kids and you could give them, you know, whatever the best advice would be to be prepared for this NIL piece at the next level, what would you, what, what would you want them to know, or what would you want them to start doing as a junior senior in high school to not be so for lack of a better term, bamboozled by NIL whenever they get to college? Yeah, I think it's uh, identifying, you know, their goals with NIL, um, what they want to get out of it, what, what really is attractive to them um, in terms of which kind of ways they want to monetize their NIL. And then as they start going through that recruiting process, um, let's say they have a list of five, 10 schools or whatever they're looking at, um, learning what are, what are the, what's the institutional policies say at those schools for NIL or what kind of offerings are they getting from the um, educational side or even like platforms or things that are resources to help them. Um, I, I think, again, it's it's becoming a big uh, part of the recruiting process and those revenue generating sports, football and, and basketball, uh, even turning in baseball a little bit, but I think it's going to trickle down to, to the Olympic sports. Um, and I mean, right in the fall, that's why these schools are all adding in the resources. Like, yes, it's very nice, of course, to support your current athletes, but it's the new arms race. Um, we've seen the facilities arms race for the past couple decades now, and now it's like, how can we help our athletes build their brand, monetize their NIL, make some money on the side of their um, already super busy schedule? So, yeah, I think first of all, just identifying you know what they want to get out of their NIL, how they want to go about it, and then starting to do some research into what schools are helping going to help them achieve their goals. I guess. Awesome. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah, that's great. I mean, I really enjoy this conversation, honestly, like, like Reed said, you're, you're way more in the weeds on a lot of these things. We're reading articles and doing as many, as much research, research as we possibly can. But, you know, this was a great conversation. I really appreciate it. Um, you know, Reed, anything else? Mm, no, just super pumped to get to talk to you today. I've, I've been looking forward to, to our follow-up conversation ever since we chatted the first time. So thanks so much for coming on and chatting with us. If you enjoyed today's discussion, make sure you check out our Athlete Story series as well as our other roundtable discussions right here on the Athletes to Athletes podcast.